Right. Um, so what I wanted to do was really just um, Marx introduced my 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 work my my career in the sense that I still spend half of my time as an academic at the University of Surrey. I still teach undergraduates. I still I run admissions in the physics department. I have my PhD students, uh, but that's for fifty percent of my time. And the other half of my time, uh, I'm a sort of public, outward-looking scientist uh, doing science communication. And I started doing this. I guess, you know, giving schools talks, talking to journalists, uh, <coughs> writing the odd magazine articles, that sort of thing, probably in the early 1990s, um, so about 25 years ago now. And I've seen huge changes in the culture of science communication and how it's perceived by the public and by other, by, by our scientific colleagues. So I wanted to sort of run through sort of a potted history of how we've got to where we are now in public engagement in science, uh, and of course, at the end, I'll just talk about some of the challenges facing us uh, today uh, and in the future. Um, I want to start by just showing you a few images because some science communication is easy and it sort of sells itself. Uh, the fillet, the, 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 uh, the lander on, on the comet, the um, discovery of gravitational waves from two colliding black holes, um, discovery of exoplanets orbiting around distant star systems. Those sorts of images you know, are, are easy to sell. Um, science journalists, you know, pick them up. Uh, they, the, the, the wider public, you know, would tend to talk about them more. Even things like Peter Higgs and the discovery of the Higgs boson a few years ago was something that captured the, the public imagination. And yet, that's a, as Mark said, that's a hugely complex uh, topic. I remember interviewing Peter on the Life Scientific, and and um, I asked him, I said, "Can you?" Uh, I said, "You're your man. You know, you're, you're here." Uh, you're, who, who better to ask to explain what the Higgs boson is? And he gave this beautiful, eloquent, two-minute description of the Higgs boson, which I love. But I, in my head, as he's explaining, I'm thinking, none of this will make it. In the this will all be edited out. It's just too common. And he, he obviously could tell the, by the look on my face that they were not going to. So it was finished. I said, well, thank you. That was really very nice. He said, yeah, but probably not good enough for the, for the public. So I thought, well, I'd, I'd, I'd be. I'll be careful what I say here. I said, okay, well, here's the challenge. Can you explain, encapsulate the Higgs boson in just one minute? He said, no. Oh, no, actually, no, I didn't. I said, can you do it in 30 seconds? And he said, no. And I said, can you do it in one minute? He said, no, this is going really well. Uh, but then he said, but what right would, you know, sort of the, the, the wider public have in, in, in expecting me to be able to explain? This is something I've, I've spent my career, I've spent half a century thinking about. It's complicated. Um, and, and it reminded me of a um, quote by Richard Feynman, who said that you know if it, if I could explain what I won the Nobel Prize for in just a little sort of bite-sized quote, then I would be worthy of winning the Nobel Prize. So sometimes some of these concepts are difficult, but they are still easy to sell to the, in terms of communicating them and, and, and enthusing and exciting uh, the, the wider public. Um, so, so headlines like this, you know, are great. Some, you know, sometimes some scientists will, you know, be be concerned about what headlines, uh, you know, how they're written. Do they encapsulate exactly what that discovery is? Uh, my first uh, encounter with the journalism that didn't actually sort of put me off science communication, but it may well have put uh, many other people off, was uh, back in '98. I was on a on a, a committee called PANS, Public. Or was it something of nuclear science, probably acceptance of nuclear science, something like that. It was academic nuclear physicists who were fed up with being, you know, um, roped in with nuclear weapons, right? So we don't build bombs, we're trying to study the structure of the atomic nuclei and how uh, stars synthesize the elements uh, uh, and so on. Uh, and so it got picked up and reported on, and the, and the article itself was fine and we got to see it. But then, of course, the sub editor of the newspaper, in this case the Independent, then provides the headline. Scientists want to, <laughs> which sort of destroys the whole point, you know, of of, uh, of, of, of what we're trying to achieve. Um, so that does happen sometimes. But I always say to scientists who want to get in, involved in communicating, particularly in terms of talking to journalists, say, look, the journalist is not there to trash your career or ridicule you, but then neither are they there to champion your work. They're there because they want a story. You, your responsibility is to give them that story. If you want people to know about what you do, and you know, I, 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 again, I echo what Mark says, what's the point of discovering something new about the world if you don't want to then go and tell everyone about it and shout about it? 
and everyone means more than just the half a dozen people who are going to read your paper in a journal. You have to do that. That's the way science works. Peer review and so on. Um, you know, you can't. You don't just. Uh, if you make a discovery, then go straight to the to, to the newspapers or go a press release. The way science works, obviously, it has to to be uh, uh, checked and and uh, and uh, scrutinised by your by your peers. But as well as that, why wouldn't not all, but most scientists want to tell uh, the rest of the, world, of the world about it. So science communication, certainly in this country, um, I don't want to trace it back to, I don't know, James Jeans and Arthur Eddington, but let's go back to uh, a sort of modern uh, public understanding of science. People like John Durant at Imperial, uh, who uh, uh, published a paper on the public understanding of science, where it, it was clear that, that people respected scientists, they were interested in science, but, uh, there were still these concerns about just how much science people knew. How do you get the, uh, the science across? It became known as the, uh, the deficit model of science communication, the public understanding of science. That the public are ignorant, uh, and, and they are there, you know, they're the empty vessels to be filled with knowledge and wisdom from, from the scientists who would just talk at them. And gradually that changed from public understanding of science to public engagement in science, a, a, a two-way dialogue. I want to run through, it's a bit of it's fun, what I regard as the 10 reasons why this country leads the world in public engagement science by a decade. No other country comes anywhere near how, you know, the way and the success that, uh, that we've had in communicating science to the public. Obviously, a lot of these ideas are not just um, restricted to the UK, but it seems that they've had a bigger uh, effect here. Um, first and foremost, we've learnt lessons from the past. If you go back a couple of decades with the BSC crisis, the GM, uh, the MMR, I, don't know, I remember with them, I, I guess many people remember as well, the MMR scientists and, and, and um, the, sort of the whole sort of health service all just shut up shop and said, look, we are not going to engage with these people, but, you know, they're, they're, they're idiots and then we're, we're not going to... And of course that was a huge mistake because then it gave free reign to those who want to uh, propagate these myths and, and pseudo-scientific ideas uh, to say whatever they liked. And I think that that has changed now. You know, the whole idea of transparency, engaging, and, and so on. A lot of these things just wouldn't issues wouldn't happen now. Uh, books, popular science. You know, um, when I was a physics student in the early to mid eighties, that I was reading physics books like John Gribben. Uh, late eighties, uh, Stephen Hawking's book came out. But of course, you know, Richard Dawkins even earlier than that. But now, I mean. Everyone seems to be writing, a lot of my colleagues in science communication, I get sort of regular emails from mates saying, you know, my new book's coming out, would you like us, the publishers, send you a copy so you can say some pithy remark that goes on the back. You know, and because you can't say anything horrible about <coughs> your friend's next book. And on the other hand, you can't say, no, I don't want to say something. But there are so many good science writers now uh, uh, compared with what they were you know, uh, a few decades ago. Of course, the rise of the internet has helped. You know, I'm talking about podcasts and blogs and social media. Um, so compared with, obviously, when many of us were, were, were young and there was no such thing as, as the internet, uh, how do you get access to, to, to uh, some of these ideas? Well, you know, everything is now readily available now, of course, but everything includes the good as well as the bad. Uh, but it's there, you know, if you want to find out about some of this, the, the latest discoveries in science. Academic respectability is probably the most important, actually. Um, I was talking to Mark before we started, and, and you know, very often in the science communication community, so those who are involved in broadcasting, those who are writing popular science books, those who give, uh, have events at big science festivals, and indeed liter literary festivals these days, and indeed, uh, you know, Glastonbury, for example, or Blue Dot Festival, uh, John Rubag, um, come from academia. So it's as though, you know, so, so when we think about the scientists in this country who work in academia, who work in government, who work in industry, it seems almost entirely those uh, academic scientists who are telling the, 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 the rest of the world about what's going on in, in, in this field. And that shouldn't be the case. Uh, but it was certainly important, certainly within academia, that those who wanted to communicate science should not be deemed as you know, those who can do, those who can't go and become science communicators. Um, uh, that has changed. 
And, and I've seen it change. So when I first started doing science communication, a lot of my senior colleagues were, were warning me against it. Uh, certainly in the, in the early to mid-90s, I had a research council advanced fellowship, or a five-year research fellowship, uh, and you know, I was expected to devote all my time to that, and you know, churn out the papers and go to the conferences and, uh, and, uh, and write grant proposals, as any research active academic is supposed to do. Um, and so why, why can't I do that and other stuff? Give, uh, you know, invited to give talks at local schools and so on. John Durant, I guess, uh, was probably the first professor of public understanding of science. Uh, I may be wrong, but I think he was. Richard Dawkins uh, was a Simonic professor of public understanding of science at Oxford. He, that, that, he's now stepped down, and, and Marcus de Sotoy has taken up that chair. Um, a few years later, Kathy Sykes at Bristol uh, was given this chair, uh, professor of public engagement in science. Um, but there were very few universities that thought that was a good thing to do. Gradually it changed. So uh, three years later, um, I, my um, uh, Vice Chancellor, Patrick Dowling, uh, at the University of Surrey, suggested I, I you know, <coughs> create this, you're doing all this public engagement, to create this, this chair for you, uh, public engagement in science. Um, so I said, well, two things. First of all, I'm going to apply for, for a full chair in physics as well, because I do not want to be you know, oh, you're not a real professor, you're a professor of media tartary. Uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to make sure that I was taken, the, 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 the respectability and the, you know, the, 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 was, was something that's very uh, uh, important to me. Um, uh, but the other thing was, I said, well, what does a professor of public engagement of, uh, in science do? So I just went to Cathy Sykes' website on, in Bristol and, and just cut and paste her terms of reference of her chair and said, that, I want to do that for half of my time. And of course, since then, many, many others uh, around, the, uh, around the UK have, have taken up roles as chairs of public engagements in science. Um, Alice Roberts, for example, she was at Bristol, and she had a hard time at Bristol because, you know, I think those at the very top of, of, of the university, the vice chancellor and, and, and pro vice chancellor, so could see the importance of public engagement, could see what she was doing that would benefit the, the university. But sort of the middle management, heads of departments, the sort of level, thought well, what Alice was doing, going off and making these TV documentaries, was uh, she had to make a choice. She either did that or she got her head down and did the teaching and the uh, admin that a uh, university academic had to do. And she left and, and, and she went freelance for a few years. And then Birmingham stepped in and created a chair of public engagement science uh, for Alice and she's now, she's now there for, for half the time. And Dee Brian Cox is now, has, spent, has one day a week uh, as professor of public engagement science here at the Royal Society. It's seen as an important thing to do. Not everyone has to do it, but universities see the benefits uh, to them. Uh, uh, not, I don't just mean sort of reflected glory of seeing you, you know, the name under, you know, if I present TV programs at the University of Surrey, way, that's us. Uh, they see the importance of public engagement uh, more broadly now. Um, and the other thing I should mention, that uh, EPSERC um, some years ago created the scheme called the um, Senior Media Fellows. Um, I think one thing to notice is all male, <laughs> which is uh, uh, very unfortunate. Um, uh, EPSRC, so they, they, they fund all engineering and physical sciences research in UK universities. And they created these fellowships that you could apply for, but you had to have a, an academic record uh, in research, an established uh, uh, record in your in your field, but you also had some uh, to have some experience in public engagement. And what they did was it, the research council bought out half of our time from the university to free us up to do public engagement, and that was tremendously liberating because then we didn't feel there was any issues with collegiality, with uh, you, know, uh, you know why we had maybe a reduced teaching <coughs> load or we weren't taking on many of the administrative jobs at universities. That's finished now, but I'll say a lot of the universities have then taken that up uh, and, and are running, they're running with themselves. They're freeing up some of their academics to, to carry out public engagement. Science festivals, every city in the UK these days seems to be running a science festival. They're growing in, in popularity all the time. Literary festivals as well are starting to, uh, to, to invite scientists to give, uh, to give talks there, not just if they've got a new book out. And of course, as I mentioned, even uh, the, some, of the, some of the music festivals around the country you know, also have a stage where you know, Infinite Monkey Cage might be recorded or <coughs> someone will stand up and give a talk about astronomy. Uh, so, so that's something that you know, in, in the other countries don't do. There, there, there are science festivals around the world, but certainly not the, 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 the quantity, the quality, 
uh, and, and popularity uh, they are in the UK. Um, linking scientists with politicians and the media, that's something that's happened. I mean, I, I, I would say the Science Media Centre has played a huge role here, the, the organisation that uh, basically brings scientists and uh, journalists together uh, so that when there are new stories, when there are uh, not just you know when the Nobel Prize is being announced, but anything uh, important, controversial, exciting uh, in, in, in science, they have a list of the scientists that they can direct journalists to to go, to go and talk to. Um, Case, the Campaign for Science and Engineering, uh, is a very good conduit uh, uh, connector between scientists in academia and more broadly in, in, in industry with politicians, and you know they will lobby. Uh, politicians and talk to them uh, uh, about issues concerning science, science funding, science policy, science education, and so on. And of course, there are other organisations like Sense About Science, Voice of Young Science, that again provide these bridges between academia uh, and, and and the outside world. Because sort of until these the organisations came along, scientists wouldn't know. You know, if, if you if you have a an important paper or you made an important discovery. Um, you tell your university, you know, in academia I'm talking about, you tell your university press officer and then they will send out a press release which may or may not be picked up. Um, these, these provide other avenues for, for communicating uh, the science that's being done. Then, of course, there are the stories in science that capture the imagination. So the uh, 2008, when the Large Hadron Collider was, was turned on and then a few years later when the Higgs boson was discovered, it was great. I mean, the, I don't know if you remember, 2008, just before the LHC was switched on, even the tabloid newspapers were talking about it. Admittedly, they're talking about it, how it was going to create a black hole that's going to swallow up the universe. <laughs> but hey, it got people, blokes over a pint, reading the sun, sitting in a pub, talking about physics. Yes, you obviously have to follow that up and say, no, it's not going to, you know, the reason why it doesn't, it's not going to create a black hole because we have cosmic ray particles with much, with much higher energy and they don't create black holes. Don't worry. But getting people curious, having people just wanting to know, even if you don't understand or, or don't need to understand details, just have that fizz of, of there's something exciting going on, I think was uh, tremendously important. Um, the Royal Society celebrated its 350th anniversary in 2010, and that kick-started a lot of activities, in particular the BBC. Then, off the back of that, BBC decided to um, call 2010 its Year of Science and commissioned a lot of science programmes. And in fact, that was essentially where Brian Cox first really burst onto the scene. Uh, he made his Wonders of the Solar System series, which took, even took the BBC completely by surprise. It was on BBC Two. They were expecting to get two or three million. They got about seven million viewers. Um, and appealing to a demographic that had never been uh, um, engaged in science before. Uh, you know, and when, once Brian goes on Jonathan Ross' show, you think, well, OK, he's, he's, he's made. So that's rock star status. And I spent a while back then actually defending him against my colleagues. Oh, yeah, he's just a floppy-haired ex-pop star. <laughs> Bloody hell, he is selling your field to, to, to the outside world. He is talking about science to people who wouldn't normally... These are not people who would, um, you know, oh, there's a good horizon on tonight uh, about, about um, general relativity or whatever, I must watch that. These are people who, who are just watching it. And if, if his sort of pop star... Um, uh, persona helps engage and get people involved in, you know, why not? So we'll talk about the Brian Cox effect in, in uh, uh, increasing the number of uh, physics undergraduates in universities. We've certainly seen a huge rise in the number of uh, students wanting to study physics at university. And of course there's the Sheldon effect, which is also uh, an equally important one. It, it shouldn't be, I mean, it's actually, uh, sort of quite seriously, the, the programs like this have made geekiness cool. You know, it, it, it's okay to be geeky. You don't, it, you know, if you want to sort of be, explain science and make it exciting, you don't have to be hip and down with the kids and know all the, all the jargon, you know, I'm just like you. There, there's certain importance of role models, uh, and I've always said, you know, sort of what Brian and I have talked about, you know, when we go and give uh, talks to schools, it's all very well, you inspire the kids with, uh, you know, with some ideas in, in particle physics or astronomy, but they're not then looking at you thinking, yep, yeah, I want to be him. You know, they say, oh, you know, that's very exciting, but I could never be Brian Cox. Um, but you, you, you get one of your PhD students to go in, who's still young and, and, and uh, you know, unpolished, 
And they're, yeah, they can see they're, they're, they're far better role models for them. But it's sort of unapologetic geekiness that that's, seems to be trendy now. Uh, science and popular culture is my last point. Um, the, uh, uh, so I actually you can see some, these four comedians. Um, you know, Dara, Green, and, and Ben Miller both have um, physics degrees. Um, but science has now sort of, I think when we talk about C.P. Snow's two cultures and, and uh, scientists somehow the preserve of the elites, you know, the, these, these boffins in the ivory towers. What has changed now is that science has become much more, I think that's where the UK is leading the world. Science has become much more part of the public conversation. People will talk about science stories, not, maybe not quite at the same level they talk about, you know, sports or politics or music or art and literature, but it's getting there into, into embedding itself uh, into, into popular culture. Um, how, how much it goes, I don't know. I, I asked the question, so is, is science as entertainment a good thing? This picture was taken from a pilot uh, panel show, science and comedy, that uh, got the, the pilot got commissioned for BBC Two. We made the pilot and then nothing else happened. So Brian was hosting it and you had two teams trying to get, so it's based on this idea of six degrees of separation, you get from one scientific concept to another that's completely disconnected. You've got to find the I mean, it was fun to do, and it was a shame it didn't go. But I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with science as, a, uh, as entertainment in, in, in terms of making the public feel more, more, more comfortable with science. It's not the only way you sell science, of course. It's not all about fun and entertainment. There are very, um, there are many more uh, important messages uh, that need to be uh, got across. And so that brings me to the final part of my, 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 my talk. Um, and just to get more serious about it, okay, so we've, we, we, we are, uh, are embedding science within wider culture, that science and culture are not separate things, it is part of culture, it's part of our uh, human endeavor. Um, but of course, the, the, the broader, maybe the more pressing issue now, today, is the fact that we need a scientifically literate uh, society. And I don't mean people who know about what the Higgs boson is or what an exoplanet is. It's knowing the value of um, evidence, knowing the value of uh, empirical science, the scientific method. Uh, how, how do you judge whether what someone is saying uh, gives them more right to say what they're saying than someone else, you know, the, the, the experts versus those who just want, you know, have an opinion. Um, and we know that there are challenges, you know, so this is the, the famous uh, triumvirate of, 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 of challenges facing the world, energy, food, and water, uh, which, which are all connected. Uh, and we know in the decades to come, this challenge is going to be ever more pressing and ever more difficult to resolve. Uh, and of course, in the middle of all of that is the, the challenge of climate change, which feeds into these. We've known this for a while, and science, um, it's not just about looking for scientific, and of course, it's not just scientific, uh, solutions that are going to resolve the world's problems. Um, I hope most scientists know that as well. Um, uh, but it's, it's making sure the wider public in a democracy, maybe, yeah, maybe uh, doesn't quite always work as we would, would like. Let me say this is a democracy, but then you vote people, people in who then have to make the hard decisions for you. Don't tell us to have a referendum. Anyway, um, this, but of course, the, the, the pressing issue ever more now is not just how you get the message across, but how do you make sure wider society hear those messages that are based on, on proper expertise ra rather than just, just opinion. Uh, you know, when everyone has to shout increasingly loudly in today's society to be heard. And, you know, when, when, uh, when the UN uh, lists the sustainable development goals. It's a very much a sort of a motherhood and apple pie list of, of, of you know, this is, wouldn't it be wonderful if the, if the world, you know, we could sort out all our problems. But you have to list the problems in order to see how you can, you can tackle them. And, and we do face a lot of these uh, uh, challenges and science will play a role. And science communication is becoming increasingly important in how you persuade 
other stakeholders, whether it's the, the media, whether it's government, politicians, whether it's the wider public. Um, the sorts, I'll just list a few uh, of the sorts of challenges. So things like demographics, we know we have an aging population, increase in numbers, we are likely to see huge movements of population, uh, whether it's down, down to climate change and rising sea levels in decades to come, whether it's economics, whether it's wars and so on, radical ideologies and so on. Um, uh, in technology, we're, 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 we're seeing advances. Very, many people have said that you know, the, the, the changes and advances in, in society due to, to technology in the last 25 years will pale into insignificance compared with the next 25 years. In the last 25 years, we've had the internet. So you know, what could be bigger and more important than that? Well, of course, we know we're going to be facing the things like cybersecurity. We're going to have to deal not just with the technology, but the ethics uh, associated with uh, an increased reliance on artificial intelligence and robotics and what that means for, 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 for jobs. Genetic engineering. Um, I, I just interviewed uh, for Life Scientific uh, a woman by the name of Jennifer Doudna, who is one of the the two inventors of, of this uh, gene editing technique, CRISPR, CRISPR-Cas9, which is, you know, we, 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 we've been able to do sort of gene editing uh, sort of with, with blunt instruments for, for many years now, but this technique that they've invented allows you to go in and just chop out individual genes. And of course, wonderful opportunities for therapeutics and dealing with certain um, uh, diseases uh, genetic diseases, but also it throws up challenges like how, you know, what do you do about people who want to have designer babies, and superhumans, and so on. So genetic engineering is, again, is something that has many ethical uh, uh, implications. In medicine, there's always the constant threat of things like pandemics, antimicrobial resistance, huge problems with the aging population, uh, and, uh, issues to do with dementia, of course. So, you know, it's not all rosy. They're, they're, they, these are the sorts of, this is just a few of the challenges that face the world. And we know that it's not just science that's going to solve them. You know, we need lots of other areas, whether it's the political will of the, the, the people we elect um, and the economic policies that, that are put in place. We need to make sure the education is fit for purpose for the 21st century. I don't think it is at the moment. Um, uh, as well as innovation and, and, uh, and, and science. So. Science communication is, just sits, it's one small, one small uh, little uh, part of this, this jigsaw. Uh, but it's an important one, it's a necessary one. Scientists, I think, by and large, certainly those I talk to, no one comes to me anymore and says, oh, yeah, you used to be a proper physicist, you know, you, you sold your soul, uh, you're just making TV documentaries. Now and again, you know, one or two will slip up and say, oh, yes, well, you're, you're a journalist now, aren't you? And I hit it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but because there's this sort of academic credibility. I mean, I, when, when young, young um, students, um, PhD students or young postdocs come to me and they want to get involved in science communication, I always ask them, I say, look, you have to make a decision. Do you want to be a science communicator? And there are plenty of those. You know, you can go and work for a, a, a science magazine, the, the, the science museum, uh, you, you can work in broadcasting and so on. Or you can be a scientist who communicates. Uh, which is what I, I did and what I want to continue doing. I don't just want to be reporting on other people's clever ideas. I want to be there doing the science as well. And, and you, we need to spread that load. Not everyone should be a science communicator, but many more scientists, whether academia, whether government, whether industry, should feel more comfortable and be encouraged to, to, to be communicating science. I realized I didn't want to leave this because this sort of seems like a bleak um, uh, uh, slide to leave it with. So I thought I'd just leave you with this one and remind you that in, in a couple of months, Cassini ends its 20-year mission and Saturn plunges into Saturn. Every, every few weeks there's another picture as it either discovers something fascinating about one of the moons of Saturn or, or it's you know, seeing Saturn's rings from a different angle that's not been seen before. So that, I didn't have any message to say about this, it's just a pretty picture to end on. Thank you very much. <laughs> That was terrific. Thank you very much indeed. So we've got a big audience, and I want this to be a good discussion. So um, there's a microphone roaming around. Hold your hands up. Say who you are. Um, and whilst you're sort of getting ready for your first question, let me ask Jim a question, or sort of maybe engage in a bit of discussion, which is, whilst you were sort of listing the 10 things that have emerged that sort of changed the 
face of science communication. I'm just thinking about the sort of, can I come up with the 10 purposes of science communication? Mm. And when you get into the purposes, it gets a lot more complicated. So you talked about excitement, imagination, inspiration. But I think sometimes the science communication goes beyond the communication. It becomes advocacy, campaigning, promotion, self-promotion. And I think there's a whole question, and you, I, in a way I was pleased you didn't mention post-truth, but yeah. it's, it's, it's what it means to be an expert. And should a science communicator be an expert? And in which case, are there codes and standards that should be associated with being a good science communicator? I, th I think to, to restrict it just to those experts in the field will be to narrow it down too much, because yeah. there are many uh, science communicators whose job it is to, to inspire, infuse, and excite, uh, who, who are you know, performers or, or, you know, or, or uh, you know, have the sort of emotional intelligence to connect with audiences in a way that is unique to them. Uh, and, and to rule them out because they don't have a PhD or they don't have an academic post, I think will be. I suppose that wasn't what I was getting at. It was more, if you like, whether there are, uh, whether there is sort of a code of practice that ought to be associated with communicating science, because you can communicate good science and you can communicate bad science. Yes. Yes. I, there isn't anything no. um, embedded, and, and I think it's sort of self-regulating uh, in that sense. You know, I I, I sit on the Cheltenham Science Festival advisory group. Mm. Uh, and in fact, we had, so we had a, a meeting yesterday at the Welcome, uh, uh, so that's why it's fresh in my mind. And, and we debate and discuss ideas for next year's festival and who to invite to give talks and so on. And so we're doing that um, policing of who, who, who are the good community, who are the good scientists, who, who's, who's controversial and maybe if, if we are going to invite them, we need to have someone yeah. to, to, to counter. But, but the, that is by no means universal. And so of course, how, you're right, but how do the public know who then to listen to uh, and who is, is, is fact and losses? And I think that is one of the critical issues because it goes back to my comment about the Higgs boson. People will trust anyone who yeah. says anything about the Higgs boson. Uh, the second uh, a scientist starts talking about bovine tuberculosis or pesticides or genetically modified organisms, then the trust in them will change very dramatically. Yes, yes. Uh, um, that, that, you know, that with all the, with the internet and everyone increasingly shouting yes. ever more loudly, it's, it's true. We, you know, the conspiracy theorists used to be, we think, you know, a, a, a small group sitting, you know, lonely people sitting in their bedrooms, you know, who, who are adamant we didn't land on the moon or, or the autism, um, MMR causes autism or whatever. But you get the impression, partly because these people are shouting more loudly now, but you do get the impression that somehow they've been emboldened and, and, and there are many more voices uh, clamoring to be heard. And, 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 and it, it is a challenge. How do you, how do you counter that? And, and, and conspiracy theories can be found almost everywhere. So you talked about the new secular rationalist movement, mm. but I'm not sure that they're necessarily new from the sort of conspiracy theories that everyone else has. I think that's, I think that's true. I think there's, uh, yes, conspiracy theories are, is, a, is a human trait <laughs> rather indeed. than a, an ideological one. Very good. Far away. A microphone coming in, and, and everyone identify themselves, please. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Catherine Monk, uh, Natural Resources Wales. Um, leading straight on from the uh, comments you just made, Samar, um, I wanted to know whether you um, have any ideas of how we do educate people in the actual processes of scientific um, development and critical analysis so that they can um, differentiate between the um, well-written uh, rubbish and the well-written mm. truth. I, I think this is something that has to be embedded from very early years of education. Uh, you know, I think we've tried over the years to, in the teaching of science, to not just be the teaching of the names of things or how things work. That's stuff that increasingly now you can just look up. You know, why why should, should, should kids learn uh, stuff that they can just Google so quickly? So, so what do you replace that with? If, if every bit of information is accessible, then we replace it with 
the scientific method and how you know and you know critical thinking and, and questioning and that, and that sort of thing. So I, so yeah, it's hard to see how you teach wider society that in general. But certainly, I think we have to have a very careful look at science provision in schools in the 21st century. Hi, um, I'm Sasha at Public Health England. That's quite interesting because we're talking about educating the children of the future, but the decision makers and the people in power are past generations, and they might be the ones who came from that two cultures. Um, and how do we get them to understand science, especially when they <coughs> they may have powerful interests that mitigate against having an understanding of science? I th then, uh, then I think it's <coughs> simply a case of numbers. You know, most. Most scientists are happy, you know, those who like to communicate are happy to go and preach to the converted and stand up at a science festival and, and, and be you know, warmly applauded for, 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 for giving a talk. I think there has to be a culture change within science, whether it's academia, <coughs> government, industry, to, to feel that we, yeah, we need to stand up and be counted. And, and we're sort of seeing a bit of that now. I mean, it used, it used to be that a lot of scientists on social media wouldn't get involved in politics, or, or you know, somehow that, and, and they'd get criticised, they'd, they'd get shouted down, stick to what you know, mate, don't, you know, don't get involved in politics, as though politics is, is the, the preserve of, you know, everyone else can have that, say that science has come. Um, but I think we're seeing scientists realising that they have to be involved, and they have to be courageous, and, and uh, stand up and, and explain. So I think the more voices there are but talking about what the, the scientific method is, the better. But can I push you on that? Because I don't actually think that the sort of science engineering technology community are standing up to be counted. Because a question I'm constantly asked is why aren't there more scientists in Parliament? And the reason for that is you can't blame the people that are there. They've stood for election. Yeah. And so I think increasingly you've got science engineering and technologists shouting from the sidelines. So engaging in politics <coughs> as critics, but yes. they're not actually participating. Yes, I think science is still seen to be, you know, if, if you're passionate enough about science, then you want to pursue it as a profession, as opposed to training in the methods of science and then going into, I mean, if you, if you stand for, uh, for parliament and you go into politics, you're a politician. With, well, a, that, well, with a background in science. That's perfectly true. And I mean, scientists who do go into politics don't necessarily find they're any <coughs> politicians than anyone else. Right. And it's a difficult thing. But, but actually, then you're also promoting sort of science exceptionalism, which is science is so special that I do it and I can't do any of this other distracting stuff. Is that really true? I mean, everyone has passions. Lawyers have passions. Business people have passions. There are people who go in from almost every walk of life, except from the natural sciences. That's interesting. I mean, I th the numbers of people studying science at university is going up. Yeah. Um, we still have a need for scientists as teachers, we still have a need for scientists in, 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 in industry. Uh, I don't know how many more scientifically trained graduates we need for th those who have other passions to filter out into, into law and, and politics and but we send the wrong message because when you go to university to read history, no one says you're going to be no, a story. No, absolutely. No, Science is a training for life in the same way that any other academic subject is. Absolutely, yes. I think yeah, there are many su subjects in the arts and humanities which are deemed as training for life, but don't close any doors in terms of future careers. Science, science and engineering is seen as a as a profession which, if you study, that's what you do. But that's our fault as I, I, academics I, 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 for promoting that as the model that you somehow fail if you don't do a PhD or and, and yeah, absolutely. And I have seen I've certainly seen that. Well it's more hands from the audience. There we are. Well done. Um, so everyone from DEFRA. Um, so Mark touched on some of our challenges um going on tuberculosis, pesticides, GM crops. And I wanted to ask you both what's been your biggest challenge on communicating science so far and how you went about it. Um I guess for me, it's, my head has gone further above the parapet in recent years when I've been presenting the Life Scientific. Uh, and I know I'm on very comfortable, safe ground if I'm talking to another quantum physicist. Because everyone says, oh, aren't you guys very clever? And uh, you know, everyone's quite happy to say, you know much more than us and we don't, we're not bothered about it. 
But when I interview uh, uh, medics, psychologists, you know, different, where it touches more directly on, on the listeners' own lives, then they, you know, they, they have, quite rightly want to have a say in it. And, and, and the challenge for me is then, you know, I'm not an expert. The guest I've had on is the expert, but of course I'm, I'm also included in that criticism. Uh, you know, whether, whether it's uh, things like climate change, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, 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 to fight it, but when it's things like health issues um, to do with obesity or, or, or whatever, then I have to be mindful of what is acceptable, what is taboo in society, what should I be courageous and standing up for on behalf of the scientific community, and what should I keep quiet on because there's a whole other conversation that I'm not familiar with. So I think that's what I found most challenging, knowing how, how and when to tread carefully with, with certain more delicate issues. I think the things I've found most difficult are where the science and the evidence are very uncertain and the feelings run high. And that's the most difficult. And that's when you need really good evidence reviews. So two topics that where feelings run quite high would be homeopathy, but that's actually dead easy because the science is so clear. And actually climate is easy as well because we have such good evidence reviews that it's really very easy to explain what the body of the science shows and what the uncertainties are. is when one gets into the areas, and there are many of the areas that death would face on a weekly basis, where the science is actually pretty incomplete, there aren't the good evidence syntheses that we badly need. And I think that's one of the challenges back to the scientific community. There's too much focus on discovering the next thing, and not enough focus on having a really good rigorous summary of what's already known. And I think that we need to incentivize that more. Um, but so there, there was a question in the front and the back, and then there's one here. Uh, Phil Raymond from Bayes. Um, you mentioned that there's a, a very important role for scientists who communicate as well as simply science communicators. I was wondering, do you think there's more of a role that universities could be playing in encouraging and training that in, for example, undergraduate courses? Um, yeah, I mean, it's something that uh, a number of us have talked about for years. So, you know, how, how do you, m m beyond just communication skills, you know, the importance of engaging the public, the, the, the ethics of, of, of certain, you know, it used to be ethics as a constraint to just uh, medicine, but you know, the, with, with things like AI and, and robotics and so on, you know, the, the, there are many areas of the, the natural sciences and engineering that, that have ethical considerations that we need to be thinking about. Um, yes, I think th th there is certainly a case for Im embedding science communication in, in undergraduate courses. But again, it's, e even though you know the UK is doing very well, a lot of the science communications come from academia. There is still a, a, a culture of well, let's 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 teach them the serious business first, and if they want to go and do um, communicating out or outreach activities, they should do that uh, uh, separately. So yeah, I'm sure there's a lot more that should be done. Please. Hello, I'm Anusha from the Food Standards Agency and I previously worked at the Campaign for Science, uh, for Science and Engineering. Um, as a virologist who moved into policy, I felt that communicating the scientific method and the actual evidence was pretty simple, but explaining why a certain policy decision was made, even though the scientific evidence said go in direction X, but the decision was to go in direction Y. Um, what, what are your thoughts with this, and then how do you convince the public uh, for the reasons underlying, um, say, the government's decision? It, it's difficult persuading the scientific community that it's not just the scientific evidence that politicians make their decisions on. You know, once you, you put it across to them, you know, that there, that there's economics, there's public acceptability, you know, that, that, that there's culture and so on. It's not just what's right, you know, in an ideal world, if nothing else mattered, this is what we would do. Um, I think pointing out to them is, is you know, that they, they, should, they get it, but it hasn't been pointed out to them that, that science uh, policy doesn't just depend on, you know, the correct science and where the evidence is. There's lots of other things that politicians have to take into account. I guess 
then Sir Mark's role in this, that's been highlighted more than for most. Absolutely right. And so, of well, course, well, scientists are forever saying that politicians should know more about science. I think politicians could legitimately say that scientists need to understand more about politics. Yes, yeah. And I think you've made the key point, Jim, which is that actually policymakers look through three lenses when they're making their policy decisions. So the first one is the evidence lens. What do I know about X or Y? That's where the science advisor comes in. The second lens is actually the policy deliverability lens, because people are always come up with great ideas for policy actually practically, there's not a chance they could be doing it, they're just too difficult. Then the third, and actually ultimately probably the most important in many cases, is values. Political values, personal values, social values, the perceived values of the electorate. And so the ultimate policy decision is made by integrating those three lenses, as it were, and the values often trumps the other two, and that is the nature of politics, and it's why it's relatively easy to be in and relatively hard to be extremely hard to be a, a policy maker. And it comes back to if you really want to be a policy maker, then you better get into real politics, and that involves standing for election. Yeah, yeah. Peter, in front row. Uh, Wendy Middleton from Bayes. I'm um, just leading on from your last question and response. So uh, at the start of the talk, you said that the UK leads on uh, public communication and engagement in science, perhaps by a decade, so as a world leader. And I guess reflecting on your challenges and the solutions to those challenges, all of the solutions, so political will, innovation, education, economic policy, scientific R&D, they're all within our politicians' gift, really. So I just wanted to sort of reflect on that earlier statement. Where do you think the UK is in terms of politi uh, political engagement? in the uh, UK, sorry, in science. In science. That's a difficult question. I, it's difficult. I think Mark probably is in a better position to answer that than me. Um, yeah, I, 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 I... Your perception, actually. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, c comparing us with other European countries, for example, I mean, it's, it's different, it changes. You sometimes think, for example, on something like nuclear power uh, and after the, um, the tsunami and the Fukushima power, the power station, uh, and you see the reaction of countries like France and Germany. In France, who have nearly 80% of their, their, their energy electricity produced by, by nuclear power. Germany, less so. Germany then you know, had this knee jerk reaction saying, We are not going down you know, nuclear. And, and initially, what they were doing is they were commissioning the building of new coal fired power stations. Which uh, uh, Germany is famously a country that it, it promotes a lot of you know green values, and the Green Party is, is quite a powerful um, movement there. Uh, and, and and so you think, well, why why are politicians there going against you know some of these rational science arguments? You know, there there are environmentalists in the UK, people like George Monbiot and uh, and others, um, James Lovelock, who became George Monbiot was pro nuclear after Fukushima. <laughs> because he realized that, you know, despite a, 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 a nine on the risk of earthquake and a tsunami, this power station didn't melt down, it didn't kill people. Um, so, what, so, so countries where I think, you know, uh, should have closer connections, you know, it's between science, engineering, innovation, technology, and, and political will, maybe just because their chancellor has a, has a science degree, I don't know. <laughs> um, sometimes can disappoint. <coughs> so I don't know whether the UK is any better or worse than some of our um, <coughs> European partners, partners for now, um, or, 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 or not. So that's, that's the extent of my, my view on it. I don't really know how and I, 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 And I think that's good analysis. And then when I think you have to distinguish science for, for policy versus policy of science, because I mean, they are interrelated but slightly different. And when it comes to science for policy, Actually, the UK government probably has the most embedded science advice of any government in the world, apart from the United States. Um, in emergencies, science comes to the fore very quickly. Um, it has come to the fore after the Grenfell Towers fire. Um, and so there's a great deal of interest in the science and the evidence, and it extends all the way up through the cabinet. Um, policy for science, again, science tends to come to the fore in emergencies. And it's, a, it's an interesting and important time at the moment with Brexit coming, and we have industrial strategy. Science is the first pillar research of the industrial strategy. 
is a strong recognition that our scientific relations with the outside world really do matter, Europe, the rest of the world. So there's an, I think there's an extremely strong and important recognition. But of course, science is part of an overall very complicated package of negotiations, which is quite difficult, I think, to disaggregate. And I think that's one of the big challenges. But uh, my sense is that actually, uh, in the government at the moment, in Parliament, there's an enormous interest in science. And actually, around Brexit itself, um, Joe Johnson has a high-level group. And I have no doubt at all that the government know what all of the issues are. Um, but it's an unbelievably complicated jigsaw puzzle of pieces just to deal with this um, uh, uh, issue. That's rather serious now. <laughs> <laughs> At the back. Days. I was wondering how you handle uncertainty in science communication. In a lot of the areas that we work in, especially in Bayes when it comes to energy, climate change, and innovation, scientists are never certain. You can't, you can never say this is 100% sure. And this is something that, when discussing with non-scientists, is very difficult to communicate. So, how do you handle uncertainty? I think by just banging on that same message, you know, sci scientists are not going to say. We are certain, but but just to to, to compare it, I think with with examples that that uh, non scientists might feel more comfortable about. You know, you can never be certain about anything, and yet we go about our daily lives and we do things based on, uh, in, in all likelihood, this is correct. And we talk about something like climate change, uh, when we can never be certain. You know, but if if you go to your doctor and he says, you know, there's a 97% chance you're going to die of this disease unless you uh, you take this medicine. You don't say, oh, so you're not sure then. So there's a 3% chance I'm not going to get this disease. Well, I don't think I need to take that medicine. It, it will be a nonsense. Uh, and so I think rather than just saying this is the scientific method, we understand it, you don't understand it, trying to compare it with aspects of everyday life, people do get uncertainty and risk uh, a lot more than we often give the wider, wider society credit for. Um, yes, okay, journalists can sometimes, you know, get, you, if, if it's something, you know, the, the risk of this disease you know, doubles if you eat this food, you know, it's gone up from 0.01% to 0.02%, you know, they don't say that uh, because they're looking for headlines. But I think the wider public do understand a lot more about risk and uncertainty, and so I think it's finding the right examples and analogies to get the message across. Yeah, and I think one of the really important issues is that policymakers have to make decisions in the face of uncertainty. And I remember when Keith Peters, who's one of my mentors, and still is one of my mentors in medicine, was sort of slightly scratching his head about why someone who'd been to medical school was possibly competent for the company she's <laughs> And he, he thought, well, one thing you have to do in medicine is you do have to take decisions in the face of uncertainty. And the one thing you can't do sitting across the clinic table from someone is to say, well, that's really very interesting. I really don't know about this. If you come back in five years when I've done a research program, yeah. I'm be able to help you. You just can't do that. And, and all the time, policymakers are making decisions in the face of uncertainty. And it's how you make, it's how you communicate that uncertainty in a way that helps them to make the decision. And I, mean, I think that's one of the big challenges. And I think that science communication is fine with uncertainty when it's about finding out the inner nature of the universe. It's quite exciting to say we don't actually understand uh, where all the dark matter is. There's all sorts of uncertainty about that. We're uncertainty about you know, what we're going to find when we're having on that um, comment. I, I think where science communication is just a completely different game is when it's the uncertainties about the stuff that affects us in the environment. Uh, the, the, the world is full of hazards. It's endocrine disruptors in uh, the water supply. It's all those difficult things where with the sophistication of science, we can measure almost the entire chemical universe in this part of Royal Society water that it labels pure. If I can tell you there's one thing that isn't, it's pure. Um, and, and that actually gives policymakers real headaches, actually. Because how do we deal with a world of 7 and a half billion on the planet and uh, an environment which we are changing all the time? And I, I think science, a lot of science communication doesn't tackle that, actually. 
This should probably be the last question because we're almost out of time. Uh, I'm Brendan Churchill uh, from the Intellectual Property Office in South Wales. Um, we employ something like 400 geeks uh, as patent examiners, uh, and we're typically communicating with attorneys and patent applicants uh, at a very technical level. Um, do you think that all scientists and engineers can learn to communicate effectively? Um, no, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, <laughs> humanity, thankfully, is a broad spectrum of, of, of personalities and, and, and emotional intelligence. Uh, not everyone is able to communicate, but there are people who are better at doing certain tasks than others. And, you know, there are those who like to keep their head down and, and do coding should be allowed to do that. They should not be forced to come out of their comfort zone and, and communicate to, to, you know, if, if that's not the sort of thing they do. But the important thing is that many more scientists who don't communicate, who would be able to, you know, those are like me and Brian Cox and Alice Roberts and so on, we just show offs. You know, we, you know, look at me, listen to me, I've got something fascinating to say, aren't I clever? Um, but a, a lot of scientists who have a passion for what they do and enjoy what they do would like to tell more people about it. And we need to make sure that those opportunities available, and you know, there aren't these barriers there, which there still are. Um, in, in academia, there certainly are, you know, you're, if you're a PhD student, your, your supervisor wants you to keep your head down and, and, and do your research. If you're a young academic, you've got all your teaching and marking and, and, and admin to do, as well as writing the research grants. Uh, and, and, and for it to be encouraged that outreach and public engagement science communication is, is, is something which that should be done if you want to, uh, I think is, is very important. And then, of course, in, in government and industry and, 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 and the, sort of the, the areas that you guys are working, there are other challenges and, 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 uh, and obstacles that also have to be tackled. Excellent. Well, thank you very much indeed. And I want to reassure you, Jim, that I think you're a critical part of the science endeavor. And I would do thank that you. because I think there are so many issues where we need to engage. Whilst I think C.P. Snow, if he came back from his 1959 read lecture, would still be able to say some things are the same, I, I think in terms of science engagement, as you pointed out through your 10 different factors, there's no question that our engagement with science in the UK has been absolutely transformative. And if you look at the media and it's multifactorial, I agree with your um, support for the Science Media Centre, I think they've done an extraordinary job. But we are in a very much better place uh, but I don't think we can in any sense be complacent. So, Jim, I want to thank you very much indeed. I want to thank the audience as well for engaging. And actually, you gave Jim some idea of the breadth of science embedding and engineering and technology across uh, government. Uh, there are probably 30,000 people engaged in government science engineering or more. So it's really important. We're very grateful that you've um, come to talk to us. So thank you, audience, but thank you in particular, Jim.